to just to do that, then we would all get together and see what counter proposals we might suggest that would make them think twice. We have three questions, uh, all of them asking you to weigh in on the issue of military spending and what situation we would be in economically if we could do away with most of it. It's an interesting question. It has both a, an obvious and a, a little more complicated answer. Obviously, we are currently fighting, depending on exactly how you count, two or three wars. I, I don't know whether Pakistan counts as a third one or part of the second one or, or whatever. It's an enormous amount of money. You should, however, be aware that most of that money stays here. That is, we talk about paying for a war over there, but it's mostly payment to American companies that make all of the equipment, to Americans who make all of the stuff that's used there, to American soldiers, to American private armies, which are now a major factor in these wars. Uh, so a great deal of that money is, in fact, what economists call military Keynesianism. In other words, it's government spending to pump up the economy, but it, the spending, instead of being on roads and harbors and schools and old age facilities and, and children and so is for military activity. But it is a way of stimulating our economy. So if you separate that question, you could say, well, there are plenty of other ways we could stimulate the economy. We don't need to have the war do that. It is an open question whether what our economy would look like if you mean stop spending on the war, end of story. This economy is heavily dependent on the support and stimulus it gets by these war expenditures since the overwhelming bulk of that money stays right here. We would have to figure out an alternative way for that kind of support since there's no evidence that the private economy can sustain even the level of, of limping along economy that we have now. Another way to say it, very briefly. Please note with me, the United States government is still the owner of the General Motors Corporation and of the AIG Corporation, and in effect of all of our major banks. We haven't privatized again. We have nationalized, we have socialized those enterprises because they cannot function yet without it. That's a sign of how serious this situation is, and the government is going to continue to look for any conceivable way to keep pumping up that economy, and the war is just a, a politically convenient, so long as there isn't an anti-war movement. If there were one, then they would have to find, and they would find, an alternative expenditure to keep the economy going without a war. But for so long as they believe that political support is there for the war, then that's a nice way of, if you pardon the expression, killing two birds with one, with one stone. I have a number of questions about the role of the labor movement. One questioner says, much of the progress in wages and working conditions from the 30s to the 70s is attributable to labor organizing and militancy, not just labor shortage. And all the questions end in some version of what will it take to get the labor movement into gear again? Okay, yeah, it's, it's a good correction of what I presented to remind us all, and that's quite right, that it wasn't just a labor shortage, that there was also the need for the labor movement to organize and struggle and fight very hard for many of the benefits that the working class got. That's, that's crystal clear the case. As to what it will take to get the labor movement uh, going, I, I am, I don't mind admitting it, in somewhat of a despair about our labor movement. It has been declining for, for 50 years, almost in a straight line down in terms of membership and of political clout. Um, its leaders, as best I can tell, have learned little or nothing over this 50-year period. They don't change their fundamental orientation. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but in general, they, they keep doing what they're doing. I understand they're working under very difficult circumstances, but it's a process of decline that makes you think that if you were in charge or you were a, a militant or an activist in the labor movement, at the very least, you ought to be having fundamental discussions about what you're not doing right that is contributing 
Not that you're the, the unions are themselves the sole explanation for their decline. That's not true. They face a very hostile environment, and that's serious. But you can't change much of that. What you can change is your own organizational life. The unions have, don't agree with what I just said. They still believe that, that lobbying and mo moving at the level of, of the legislatures and the federal government is their only and major hope. That's where they spend the bulk of their effort and their money and their staffs. Uh, I don't see it working, but they are fearful of, of achieving even less if they don't do it. But having said all of that, there are a couple of signs of something. And here's the one that I'm most excited about, even though I understand it hasn't gone very far. I believe it was about a year ago, maybe a bit more, that one of our largest unions, United Steelworkers of America, made a remarkable decision, different from any that I know the American labor movement had made before. They entered into a formal agreement, which they announced, with something called the Mondragon communities in the north of Spain. Now let me tell you briefly, for those of you that may not be familiar, a little over 50 years ago, a Catholic priest in the Catalan area in the north of Spain, just below the Pyrenees Mountains, began a program to deal with unemployment in that region, which is an endemic problem, in which, apropos of what I said earlier, workers would own and operate their own enterprises collectively. No capitalist structure, no top-down hierarchy, no board of directors, no shareholders. The workers themselves would do it. And here we are roughly 50 years later. I believe the numbers are now about 100,000 workers are members of the Mondragon communities producing an immense array of goods across an immense array of enterprises. Um, they solved the problem of labor not by driving a better bargain with an employer through collective bargaining, the American approach, but rather by a radical reorganization of production of the sort that I was pointing at at the end of my talk. And it, the, it's amazing that an American trade union basically put out a statement saying, we now need to think of a kind of two-track approach. On the one hand, where it's appropriate, we'll continue to represent workers in bargaining with employers for better wages and working conditions. But on the other hand, we are allying with Mondragon to begin to explore in the United States a labor movement that would begin to push for, to work with, to organize workers to take over and run their own enterprises. And for those of you that may have seen Naomi Klein and her husband's film, The Take, about the workers who took over the factories in Argentina, it's the beginning of a sense, wow, maybe what the program of a left in America would be for unemployment today is not just that the federal government would hire, but here's what a left would say. It should hire, but in enterprises that those workers themselves would operate and collectively run. So that for the American people, an unemployment program would also give a second, even more important benefit. Americans would for the first time have real freedom of choice to work in a top-down capitalist enterprise or in a collectively run enterprise by workers on their own. And we as consumers would have a parallel choice. We could buy the products produced by a capitalist enterprise or with the same spirit that now drives some of us to buy fair traded coffee, we would buy commodities that would have written into the sleeve of the jacket not just the country where it was made, but whether it was a capitalist or a communitarian, I'm avoiding that scary word, uh, enterprise <laughs> that we wanted to support with our purchasing dollars. That's an interesting recognition by a major American university that a radical change in what it means to be a labor organizer is maybe beginning to sprout. And that I would take to be very hopeful. You've described basically a long process through which the people running America's largest corporations in undermining the wages of their workers have undermined the capacity of the American consumer to absorb their products. Now, we have several questions asking why you think these corporations have willingly taken actions 
that then threw them into crisis. It certainly wasn't a given three years ago that they'd be bailed out the way they were. That's a very important question because nothing I say should be interpreted, and I will be really upset if I think that some of you are in inferring or that I have done anything to suggest that anything about our economic system is under control. It is not under control. And let me give you some examples and then I'll get to, to the specific question. When George Bush faced his second term, he and the Republicans understood that the worst possible thing to do in terms of the chances of a Republican replacing George Bush for the next presidency would be to have an economic crisis happen in the last year of his presidency. That is the worst. And he assembled the best economics advisors he could find. Larry Summers type people. <laughs> you know, with all the pedigrees one could ask and he assembled them and he gave them resources and power and influence. Everything. Complete failure. They had a collapse in the last year, and he was blown out of the, and with them the Republicans were blown out. That lesson was not lost on Mr. Obama. He assembled the best economic <laughs> advisor he could, and Larry Summers and everybody who had ever worked or even looked at Mr. Clinton uh, was assembled there in the White House to make sure, because the last thing on earth he would want for his agenda is the, uh, so he has 10% unemployment going into the midterm elections, and he is effectively damaged badly in the political outcome. So much for having it under control. Best minds imaginable, best measurements, I mean, economy in a bleh. Right? General Motors, let's take a private example. General Motors. Let's remember, coming out of World War II, the biggest automobile company in the world, control a third or 40% of, uh, of the car market in the United States, expanding in the world, taking over Opel in Europe and, and on. It, it was on top of everything. It, uh, it's a defunct, it's a shell of itself now. It's a company that, that collapsed, is taken, owned by the government right now. It, it, it assembled the highest paid, best advisors of David. <laughs> Merrill Lynch, the biggest stockbroker in America, had his fingers in every town and you know, nothing. It's a subsidiary of the Bank of America. Nothing. So being under control, making decisions, they really know what they're doing. No, they don't. They make the best decision they can. They're subject to many more. If, if you go to a boardroom, I've done this a few times in my life in big corporations, they're the first ones to tell you, we can control, this is their language, we can control these many variables. They like to sound mathematic. But there are many more variables that will determine the outcome, and we don't have control over those. So one of the most important skills we can develop among our managers is the ability to understand that lots of things are going to happen for which we had no plan and no expectation, and you have to be flexible and that's how they talk. But it is a kind of grudging recognition that, yes, they make plans, and yes, they try, but they, like you and I, are subject to all kinds of political, cultural, economic complexities that can make Toyota succeed and General Motors collapse. That's the way it is. Merrill Lynch is gone. Wachovia is gone. Wells Fargo is here. But don't count on that either. They'll disappear too. It's not under control. Corporations are, are now moving out of the United States to get to this question because that's the best shot they think for them to survive. They have to produce elsewhere because the American society hasn't been broken down enough to make it profitable to stay here. The wages are not low enough yet. The constraints on what they can do are not few enough yet, but they're counting on centrist Democrats and Republicans to accelerate the process, and that's their position. You want us to stay here? Make it worth our while. And the same thing goes with the market. The market is not growing here. 
The market is growing elsewhere, so American corporations are going to go there. By the way, they know there are risks in there. There are no guarantees, but it's the best they can figure out to do, and we're going to live with the consequences, good, bad, or indifferent, of the gambles they're making. I again remind you, we're going to live with the results of the gambles a tiny number of people are making for doing what's in their interest in terms of profit and business growth. For us to believe that what they do for their interest will in some magical way end up being the best for all of us is a level of gullibility we should have outgrown around age six. <laughs> but some people haven't. You all know, or you should, the history of economics, my discipline. We celebrate as the founder of economics a deeply religious man, a professor of religious studies named, that's what he was, Adam Smith. He needed to come up with a theory to explain how it might be that if every individual economic actor, businessman or woman, worker, banker, if each one is concerned only to secure their own personal immediate interest, it will somehow work out. The man was a deeply faith-driven person. If each of us does what's just good for us, it will end up being the best for everybody. It will be as if God, he was a religious man, took each and every one of us by the hand and led us to so define our individual interests that it produced the best for everybody. It would, if you remember the phrase, it's as if we were all led by an invisible hand to do... Okay, this is a charming idea, but it really is a pretty thin rationale for businesses to do exactly what they want, for the rest of us to believe that that's the best outcome we can get. Maybe that was good in the 100 years that the United States rose as an economic power. It doesn't ring anything other than hollow now. And so we should outgrow. Recognize it for the charming image it was, but not to take that seriously. It really is an, a variation of trickle-down economics. I'm going to take some liberties interpreting our final question. You began the talk by identifying yourself as a Marxist. Yeah. Uh, when it came to the prescriptive part of your talk, you talked about the importance of democratic worker control over the firm. As inspiration, you cited an agreement between the steelworkers and an anarcho-syndicalist organization in Spain. The question is, what do you think of the economic theories of Noam Chomsky, which I'm going to reframe as Professor Wolf, are you changing your colors from red to black? Uh, no, no. Uh, it's way too late in my life uh, for such things. No, I'm, I'm a red. Um, and I should mention, and I'm trying to use my facial expressions as part of this, I am a happy Marxist. <laughs> ah, I don't apologize or retreat or anything. I understand that among the people who call themselves Marxists, there are people I have no interest in or connection to, that I disagree with. But any of you, those of you who call yourself, I don't know, Christian or Jew or Republican or Democrat have the same caveat that you have to articulate. So with that behind me, no, no, no. I, I don't imagine that this is all going to work out because little groups of people do something and then it'll magically come together. Now, I believe we need strong, well-developed organizations. I'm not against organization. I am not an anarchist. I, I understand that there's an impulse behind anarchism to be critical of the state, to be critical of institutions. That part I like. But I, I take seriously that we face a, a capitalism 
that is not about to disappear, that is not about to go home and admit that it hasn't worked out real well and give us a chance. It's not going to do that. It's going to utilize all of its organizational means to confront us with obstacles and difficulties or worse. And it would be naive and irresponsible, I think, for those of us on the left to imagine without organization that we can be a credible alternative. So no, that's one of the reasons I gave you the example of what's happening in Europe. They are making a struggle against austerity because they have organizations. That's what's allowing them to do it. That's the network and the, the skeleton around which people think politically. That's our problem in the United States. Europeans understand, not all of them of course, but in a much greater number than here. You don't solve a social problem with an individual solution. You need a social solution and a social movement to win a social solution. And they see those organizations, not uncritically, they have all their criticisms of them, but they see the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the Green Party, the trade unions and so on as important institutions with all their differences that can allow social expression. So that a worker in, in France, it's a country I know best because my family comes from there, that a worker in France thinks of the trade union and the socialist and communist parties as important ways of expressing his or her upset with what's going on, a way to change the direction of society. Sure, you take individual steps for your own needs and crises, but you don't stop with that. You also want, need, and respect organization, the need to support it, to sustain it. Organizations are flowers that need nurturance and watering and care and respect. Americans have been taught much too much that an organization is a danger, a threat, a fearful thing that will take away your precious individuality. We're a country obsessed by individuality and we go into a McDonald's that looks exactly the same in Seattle as it does in Scarsdale. <laughs> We all wear the same jeans. It's extraordinary, the, the split mentality we have, but it doesn't mean that that isn't an important impediment. And we have, to come, we have to find a way as a nation to understand and respect organizations or else we will only be occasional nice folks, including professors, giving talks. And that's only a small part of what has to happen and what all of you have to do. So let me thank you again for coming. Let's thank Professor Richard Wolff.